spend this morning with you guys. If you are brand new here today, um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Pastor Joel. Uh, I'm the handsome pastor here at the warehouse. Just kidding, I'm the funny one. But uh, anyway, so so today, oh man, the laughter meant that was true. Uh, but anyway, so today we're jumping into uh, uh, week three of our series called Not Yet, where we're talking all about all those things that we're waiting for in life, right? Because the season of waiting can be difficult. Uh, it can be hard. It can be challenging. And the thing is, is probably more often than we realize, we daydream about the future quite a bit, right? Anybody else here? Anybody else here a daydreamer? Anybody here daydream about like your future, like your future hopes and plans? How many of you guys like feel like you know what you want to be when you grow up? Like, you know, like what kind of career you want to have and stuff like that? Or, you know, some of your other future goals of, of what you'd like to see your family be like, like, like how many kids, you know, you, you want 2.5 kids and, and all this other stuff. I don't know. It's a, I don't know. Mine, mine are still in the half stages. They're, they're small. But uh, anyway, so uh, no, but uh, whatever it might be, like, like you have all these ideas of what your future might, might look like. I know for me, like when I remember being in fourth grade and being like, I can't wait to be a husband and, and, a, and a father. Or, like, like at such a young age, like, but our, our daydreaming and our, and our hopes for our future and plans start at a young age. Like, like even my, my, my youngest ones, like Augie, like he knows for sure he wants to be a T-Rex someday, you know, and uh, like he, and, and the, the challenge that we deal with in, in life is sometimes things don't go according to plan. Like sometimes as, as, as we're, we're, we're growing, we realize T-Rex in it might be out of my cards, you know, like, like, like the cards is not, might not be there, uh, whatever it might be. But but from very, very early on, we start daydreaming about the future. We start, we start making hope, we start building our hopes on, on future plans. And today we're going to be talking about those plans and how we can learn to center our plans in the middle of God's will. But really quick, how many of you guys played the game MASH growing up? You guys know what I'm talking about? Look like this. You, you, you wrote down like, like MASH at the top and it was like mansion, apartment, shack, house. And then you had uh, your, your future, like future spouse. You had, you had where you'd like to live, what kind of money you'd want to make, what kind of car, uh, job, pets, all that stuff. I remember, maybe you guys did this too. When we were growing up, whoever was like leading the mash game would get to pick one of your options. Like you would pick three and they get to pick one. So you'd like, you'd name like the three people that you like and then they would name somebody that they knew you definitely didn't like. And that's like, mm, that's an option. You know, like, like whatever it might be, you're like, not, not her, not her, not her. You know, or, uh, like different things, like like they put all the pets there and, and they put a cat on there and you're like, why are you wasting space? Like you just ruined ink, you, you know, but, but then you, but, but some of those things come true. Like you eventually have a daughter who insists on having a cat, you know, and like, like all those things. But, but we play games like that when we were a kid. How many of you guys played MASH? I'm just curious. All right, but more, more than I thought. Okay. So we play those games growing up because we are so curious and interested in our future. Like, like it is in our heart to, to think and, and, and long and yearn for things of the future and those plans and to want to plan. How many of you guys would say you're a planner? Like you, you like to plan stuff out, all right? How many of you guys are like, no way. Like I don't like to plan stuff out, all right? But those of you guys who aren't even planners still probably have plans in your mind that you just don't identify as plans, right? Like, like, like hopes and dreams of, of your future. But no matter how much of a planner you are, or aren't the future can be very unpredictable. All right, like like I remember when I was when I was a senior in high school, I was looking at a bunch of different schools uh, where I wanted to go, and there's one school I was really interested in. It was Kentucky Christian University because I was going to school to to pastor it up and everything. And so I, I, I go down to Kentucky to, to check out the school and it had everything I love. First, I love, I love the mountains. Um, I like the, Kentucky has beautiful sunsets, especially where KCU was uh, and all this stuff. Like there's lots of great things. Like the, the college was, um, so there was Kentucky Christian and then right next to, to where I lived was Ohio Christian about thir 30 minutes away. But there's several things that Kentucky Christian offered was one that had like the mountains and great hiking and all that stuff and beautiful scenery. Uh, it was three hours away from home, which was uh, like, it sounded like a good idea to me because like my home life was difficult. And I'm like, I could use some time away. Like, I had all these plans of why it was great. In fact, I went down on a college visit to check it out. And we're, we're stopping at McDonald's to get egg McMuffins as you do. And, uh, and I remember like driving up to, to the window and the, the, the girl reaches out and she goes, she, and she's like, my, she's like my age. She's like, here you go, sweetie. And I'm like, Oh, you know, <laughs> like, is this like, like, do does this like one of those things where I, I need to like, like change my plans and like go eat inside? Like, am I dining in today? Like, is there something there? You know, like, 
Like it seemed like a perfect scenario. And then I, then I realized, like maybe, dude, does every does everybody get called sweetie here? Is this something special? Like, am I special? You know, and uh, but it, it seemed like a great place to go. It had great professors, like that, like written books and stuff. But then my my uh, my pastor at my church said, hey, why don't you go check out Ohio Christian? That's just thirty minutes away. Um, that's where I went. Blah blah blah. And I'm like. All right, I'll, I'll humor you. So I went to check it out, and I was not interested. It was too close to home. I, I thought it was, uh, it was, it didn't have like the same amount of renown as as the other school did. Didn't have the same type of like professors that had written books. It had Carl, you know, was teaching the class, and uh, it just didn't seem like as nearly impressive of, as a place to go. But I go and I check it out, and I'm sitting there in a class. I'm sitting in a class that's on, on the book of Acts in, in the Bible, and I'm sitting next to an upperclassman. I'm, I still remember him to this day, Jason Otero, and uh, and I, I'm sitting next to him, and I'm like, uh, and uh, the, the guy's teaching, and he Jason looks over at me, and he, he, he slides me a sheet of paper and a pen. And in, the, in this moment, like, I'm praying, like, all right, God, where do you want me to go? Where, where do you want me to go? What? I know what I want to do. What do you want me to do? And, and I'm praying about it. And Jason slides me this this paper and a pen, and he's like, "Hey, here you go, man. That way you can t- you can take some notes." Like he just wanted to, wanted to like help me grow, help me get as much. Like even though I'm just checking out the school for a day, it's like, "Hey, take advantage of this. Make, make the most of it. Grow grow as much as you can." I'm like, "That's, that's really cool." And, and I'm here. I am praying about it. And in that moment, like like I just really felt like God was talking to my heart. Like, dude, this is where you're supposed to be. And and, and on paper. It, it would not be the place that I should I should have chosen. You know, on paper, it didn't look like the best option, but luckily God wasn't limited to doing things on, on paper. You see, sometimes our plans don't always work out the way that we'd written them, the way that we had planned them out, or the way that, that we would choose for them to, right? And, and maybe, maybe like when our plans change, how many of you guys have had plans change in your life? It can be frustrating. It can be stressful, the, the dealing with the unpredictability of life. And it can feel like a really big deal. And sometimes it's stressful when you're just trying to write your own plans. But then when you throw in the mix of like asking the question, all right, God, so what do you want for my life? Like, like trying to factor in your own wants and, and desires, but then also trying to incorporate what God wants for your life. That can, that can add a whole extra element to it. It can add an extra element of stress. But what I hope you get out of today is understanding that it can also add an extra element of trust an extra element of security that that rests beyond your own shoulders, beyond your own strength, and beyond your own wisdom. See, because when we ask the question, what does God want for my future? That can be scary because we start to ask all these questions. Like if God really has a plan for my future, then then do I have a say in those plans, right? Do I, do I have a say in those plans or or how do I find out even what those plans are? Like, all right, like how's God going to like like magically gift this information to me? Or Or what if God's plans don't sound very fun? Or don't match the plans that I was making for myself. What if God's like, no, no, Augie, you can't be a T-Rex. You got to be a real human. You got to be a real boy. Like, like, what about when God's plans are different? Like, that scares us, right? Because there's that fear of losing something that we felt like we had our eyes and our, 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 our heart and our eyes set on. But what I hope you'll get to see today is that the more that we trust God, the more that we, God can move us into a place far better than we could have written for ourselves, just like we see in, in this video right here. Somebody taught him about traffic pretty well. But uh, anyway, so, so what I love about that video, and the reason why I want to share it today is, is what, honestly, like, we think we're pretty brilliant. Like, we, we do. We, we can be very self-assured, but I guarantee you that any plans that we come up with are like our plans are like that little kids compared to God's. Like God's like, you could go anywhere in the world, you could go to Paris and we're like that way. <laughs> you know, because we're we're reactionary. We're reactionary people. We look at the immediate and we're like, I want that right now. Or, right? Like, like when, when I was dating growing up, I thought for sure, like, I'm gonna date this person, we're gonna get married, blah, blah, blah. Like the, the person I ended up marrying didn't even live on the same half of the state as me. You know what I mean? Like, like God's like, this is this this is really cute that you think you got it all figured out and like you're like putting this all together. You know, like don't worry, I, I got you. You know what I mean? Like, like I thought I had it all figured out. And when some of those like relationships ended, I'm like, God, that was my only chance at love. And God's like, you're, you're, you're a little kid. You know, you forget about it. You know, like you, you're just, you're right now, you're just being like that way. You know, like that's what I was doing. You know, and, and sometimes like we look at when we're trying to think about God's plans, we're like, uh, God, do you really know what you're doing? When the reality is God's often looking at us. It's, it's kind of like that phrase. Have you guys ever heard somebody say, if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans, right? Like, like, like it's a sure way to make God laugh. He's like, yeah, that's, that's cute. You know, it's like him, like him watching that video. 
All right, but, it's, but going back to that decision for me to end up, end up going to a different school than what I had originally intended on, what ended up happening is, you know, like I said, God, I really felt God lead me in that moment of like, it didn't make logical sense for me to not go there, but to go there, to go to OCU instead. It didn't check off some of the things from my list. There was nobody there that called me sweetie, you know, in a really cute Kentuckian accent. Like, like none of that was there. But what I didn't know was later my freshman year of college, my dad's cancer was going to come roaring back with a vengeance. What I didn't know was that, that I, was, uh, I was going to be responsible for taking my dad to doctor's appointments um, w- one day a week, that I was going to have to be skipping out on classes, and, and I needed to be at a school that would be okay with that, and I needed to be at a school that would be accessible to that. And if I was three hours away, I wouldn't have been able to be there for that. But because I was near, I could take part in that. But I, di- I didn't realize when I started going to OCU that my dad was going to end up passing away while I was in college. I didn't realize that, that when I was making that decision, that, that I needed those extra years to make the most of them while my dad had very limited time left. But I made the decision that ended up just, just trusting God, even though God didn't give me all the, he didn't give me all the plans, the details and the the steps in between. He just said, take this step. All right. I'm like, well, that's not where my feet were originally going to go, but okay. You know, and he's like, all right, now just take this step. Just take this step. And what I, what I realized looking back was that God could see far bigger than I could. God's perspective was much wider than, than, it, than mine was, and he could see all the details that I couldn't predict. See, God could see the, the friends that, God was, that he was going to bring into my life that were going to help carry me through some really, really difficult times. Yeah, um, like, I didn't see... I didn't see that that three years later, there's going to be some hot babe named Danny <laughs> that's going to be showing up there. You know, I didn't see all of those different things coming. You know, all I, all I knew was God said, this is the next right step. This is the next right step following it. And, and what we learn is, is that when we start to trust God, all right, and, and, we, and not just trust him and like, all right, God, I trust you, but I'm gonna do things my way, just trusting that you'll like shield me. No, when we actually like talk to God and say, God, I am inviting you into the process. I am inviting you into the decision and, and I'm actually trying to remove as much of myself as I can and just hear from you. When we do that, when we say, hey, God, show me what you want me to do. Hey, I, I open up God's word and, and, I, and I open it up and I'm like, all right, God, show me what you say about what you want for me. God's word will actually guide you. God, God, God's word didn't say, hey, OCU. You know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like there was magic letters highlighted in my Bible that said OCU. But what God did do was he gave me constant steps. He gave me each next step. But then he also, through digging into his word, he allowed me to learn how to hear his voice. So that in the things that were a little bit more like, all right, how do I get a clear answer on this? Like when there's, it's not direct in scripture, like, like there's some principles that God gives you in scripture that helps you know who to date and who not to date. All right, there's principles that God says, hey, let me help narrow way, way down for you. I can, I can eliminate like this many people for you and know your options. Like, like God does that, but it doesn't necessarily say where to go to school. It doesn't say what your career is gonna be. But when you start to listen to God and all those other things, then you start to learn how to recognize his voice in the rest of the things. This is what it says in, in Psalm 40, uh, King David's writing here, and we're not sure what pa- stage this is at in his life, but he, he says this all right, in, in Psalm 40. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and he heard my cry. See, th- it's really important that David starts off saying, I waited patiently for the Lord, because that was something David was very, very good at. David learned at like age like 12 or something like that. I might be off by a little bit, but he learned at like at a very young age, Samuel comes rolling and he's like, hey, you're going to be king someday. Imagine if you learned that you were going to be the future king at age 12, how you would misuse that. You know, you'd walk into high, you'd walk into school the next day. Like, yeah, you like walk up to the football coach, like, yeah, I'm quarterback today. And he's like, he's like, no, you cannot throw at all. You're terrible. You know, and you're like off with his head. You know what I mean? Like that, that's what you would do, but not David. David waited. And not only did he wait, he waited when, even when oppor- like looked like opportune times for him to take the throne. There's opportunities that he had, to, that he had where he could have killed the king who was currently trying to kill him. And he's like, no, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to hurt the king because you know, the, like, that's not my spot. It's not my spot to jump forward in God's plans. God will open the door when he's ready. Like he does this over and over again. He literally waited patiently for the Lord, even when his life was on the line because of it. He says, he lifted me out of the slimy pit and out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. He says, many will will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. 
Trust is going to be a really key word here today. He says, um, he says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and who does not look to the proud and to those who turn aside the false gods, God, gods all, these, all these fake things trying to lead us in the wrong direction. He says, many, um, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. I, the things you have planned for us, none can compare with you. See, David's understanding that God had great plans. And, it, and usually a lot of times David's writing, it's in the midst of difficulty. Sometimes when we're in the midst of difficulty, when they're in the midst of, of hard times that we can't see, we can't see the future. The future looks scary. The, the, the future looks murky. We have to learn to listen to ourselves less and, and speak to ourselves more. And that's exactly what David says, it says here, is he reminds himself, I am waiting patiently. I am trusting God, and, and I am knowing that God's plans, the, the plans that he, the things he has planned for us, none can compare. None can compare with God and his plans that he has for us. That's exactly what he understood, and those are the words he would give himself for comfort, even when life is difficult. Jumping forward, uh, you know, about a, a, a thousand years later, or 700 years later, whatever, um, we see Jesus and the disciples, and they're hanging out. And, and here's Jesus and the disciples, and, uh, and they're, they're talking, and Jesus asks the disciples, he's like, hey, who does everybody say I am? Like, how do they describe me? And they, they give an answer. Like, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He's like, all right, now wh what about you guys? Who do you guys say I am? And then Simon Peter, who's like always the first kid in class to like raise his hand. You know, it's like almost like permanently up there. He's got like tendonitis or something that does it. But he's like, he says, he just says, who do you say I am? He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And what he's saying here, because we don't throw around the term Messiah a ton. He's saying, you are the savior. You are the redeemer. You are the one who's going to come and fix all of this mess. You are the guy that's coming to fix all that. And Jesus is like, Good job, Peter. He's like, he's applauding him. He's like, he's like, good job because you didn't, you didn't learn that from the world. You didn't learn that from people. You learned that directly from God. The, you know, the Holy Spirit's putting that in your heart. He says, you learned that from the Father in heaven. He says, I'll tell you, Peter. And he starts calling, he starts calling him Peter instead of Simon. All right, he changes the name and Peter means rock. All right, and he says this, he says, he says, uh, I'll tell you that you are Peter. All right, this is your new name. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not overcome it. All right, this is a huge statement Jesus is making to Peter. He's saying, hey, this truth bomb that you just dropped, the work that you're about ready to do and this truth that you're standing on, I am going to build my church. The, the church that is going to change the entire world is going to start right here and you are going to be a key part of it. I'm sure, I'm sure Peter was like flying on cloud nine right there. Like we don't see what his reaction is, but I'm, I'm sure he was pretty excited about this. But then right after this, it says that, that then from then on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples the next stage of his plan, all right? And so Peter gets this really good news, like, hey, I got a really big plan, and, and Peter, you're a huge part of it. Oh, hey, by the way, guys, um, we're going to start heading to Jerusalem now, and when we get there, I'm going to die. <laughs> like like, the, like the, the priests, the elders, the, the, the Pharisees, they're going to kill me. They're going to take me out, but I'm going to raise three days later. All right. And, the, and the, the disciples, they tend to focus on the bad news. Like, what? You're going to die? Peter's like, no way. This is never going to happen to you. I'm not going to let it. All right. Peter's like yelling at Jesus. Are right? you saying this shall never happen to you? It says, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, he says, get behind me, Satan. All right. He's saying, get behind me, you enemy, you roadblock, you stumbling block from the path God wants from me. He says, you're a stumbling block to me because you do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. You're like a kid looking at a hot dog stand. You're missing the point, Peter. That's exactly what he's saying to him, that, that you're not getting it because God is up to something bigger. You see, sometimes when God's leading us to his plan, there's scary times in it. There's difficult times. There, there's bumpy roads. And so Peter, here's Peter feeling like there's some conflict between the two things Jesus said. He's saying, Peter, I'm gonna do huge things through you. Hey guys, watch out, I'm about ready to die. All right, these two things aren't computing how they can both be reality for Peter. But what Peter's not realizing is this thing, this good thing, this good news can't happen without the bad news. It can't happen if there's not those growing pains to force it to happen, to lead it in that direction. All right, Peter couldn't see that. Peter couldn't see that he, could, he couldn't be there to lead the church, to, to help start the church, if Jesus didn't first become the sacrifice to initiate the church. See, Peter couldn't see it. He couldn't see all those details. And because he couldn't connect the dots, he freaked out. 
He flipped out on Jesus and said, Jesus, you don't know what you're doing. I'm going to stop you. We're going with my plan now. You're now starting to show that you can't be trusted, that you don't, you don't, you don't see the whole picture. So let me help you out, Jesus. Let me show you a better way to do this. Like, that's exactly what Peter's doing. All right, and Jesus is like, no, trust me. Trust me. Let, let me help connect these dots. See, see how, could, how could Jesus use Peter if he was dead, right? In Peter's mind, the, these, plans, these plans are wrecking the future that Jesus had just promised him. They didn't make sense. They didn't sound fun. They didn't sound to him like something God would do. How could God send his son to die? That didn't make sense to him, but it definitely didn't sound good. See, what Peter didn't realize is that we don't get to see the whole picture. All right, we don't, we don't get to see the whole thing. We just get a glimpse of the moment, the, the promise and the future, but not all the in-betweens. All right, he did, we don't get all the picture. All we get is the next step. But Jesus, of course, knew things that Peter didn't. Jesus, just like in my story, Jesus knew things that were coming up on my road ahead that I couldn't prepare myself for, I couldn't plan for, but he could plan for. He could map out a way. He could map out a way to grow me rather than hinder me. Because if I would have went to Kentucky, when my dad was going through all of his stuff, probably what would have happened is I probably would have had to drop out of school. And there would have been a good chance that I, maybe I never got went back. My, my whole school thing and my whole career path could have completely changed if I wasn't faithful and obedient to what God was calling me to do. All right. And the same goes for each and every one of us. You see, even what Peter had to recognize is that even when life is difficult or confusing, Jesus can be trusted. And, that, and, the, and then the next thing is he, he needed to remember that the, the past. He, had, he needed to remember all the things he had seen Jesus do. Like he's watched Jesus heal blind people. He's, he's watched people, uh, Jesus heal people that, that were paralyzed. He's watched Jesus feed thousands of people. He's seen him walk on water. And he's looking at Jesus in this moment. He's like, dude, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> your plan's stupid. <laughs> like, 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 why would you do that? And, he, and he's yelling at Jesus. But what he needed to do is remember all the good things that Jesus had done. And be like, all right, you probably do. You, you probably got this. All right. And then, and, then, and then the future, you need to remember that he could trust that Jesus had good things planned. All right. Because here's what I want you to know is that the same God who can be trusted with their future can be trusted with our futures too. The same God that's, that's guided every single generation before us to do some pretty incredible things. Every single person that you know that's been passionately following Jesus, that you've seen how God's done incredible things through them, Jesus wants to do through you and through our generation as well. All right, and so keep that in mind because even when you don't know the specifics, what you do need to know is that God's plan for you is good. God's plan for you is good. And so what I want you guys to learn how to do, because this is the same thing that guided me in making my big decisions in life and even my small decisions. Because what you need to know is this, is that, that trusting Jesus doesn't start with the big decisions. All right, it, it, it eventually leads to the big decisions, but it, it, the way that you practice it, get ready for the big decisions, is by learning to talk to Jesus through all the small decisions. Like, I talk to Jesus about everything. I talk to Jesus about where I'm getting lunch, <laughs> like, that, that day. And there's been so many times that Jesus is like, go to Wendy's. I'm like, I hate Wendy's. And he's like, go anyway, shut up. <laughs> and, and I go, and then God gives me that perfect conversation with somebody that I didn't expect. And it starts with things like that, but that eventually lead to those bigger decisions, like, hey, who am I going to marry? <laughs> How many kids should we have? What career should I do? You know, but it starts with talking to God in the small things. So what I want you guys to do is learn, actually, learn how to pray. Learn how to pray and talk to God. I'm going to give you guys a couple of questions to ask, but then also learn to start digging in God's word to ask these questions, all right? And so here's a, here's a couple of things is, is ask God, all right, what, what am I wondering, hoping, or fearing about my future? And, and I'm going to give you a second to practice it, put this into practice here in just a second. We're going to play a song, and I want you guys to, to think and pray through some of these things, even while the song's playing. The next thing is, is how has God been good to me in the past? Allow God's past track record of how he's helped you in ways that you couldn't see a way out. Allow, allow those, those memories to, to propel you forward, even the things that are difficult to trust in now. And then the next thing is, is why do I trust God for my future? Think about God's character. Think about who, he's a, who he is. The thing I always tell people to ask themselves is, is, does God love me? Does he want what's best for me? And does he know better than I do? If you're like, yeah, to all those things, then why would I not trust him in this? So check out this, this video and then take some time to pray about these things as you listen to the word. I know one of the hardest things is when you're going through something really difficult and it's really hard to see the whole picture. Like, what is God up to in the midst of this? You know, it's easy to maybe trust God and it's like, hey, I want you to date this person. You're like, all right, cool. I, I like dating. All right. So, you know, but it's harder when you're in the midst of a storm and a trial and you're like, all right, God, what are you up to in the middle of this? What are you up to in this? 
And so when we learn to talk to God through all of it, but then we also learn to dive into God's word and allow him to bring us comfort, allow him to bring us direction and healing and hope through it, man, you can be unstoppable. And God can take you to places that you would have never written yourself. But trust me, he can write a far better plan than we ever could. And with that being said, the biggest thing that I want you to take away is learn to invite God into the process of every single plan that you make and allow him to, to write a story better than you could write yourself. Let's pray. God, I thank you for every single person in this room. Lord, whatever they're going through in their own heart and their, their life, the decisions that they're trying to make, Lord, I just pray that you would help them learn to make you the center of their plans. God, that they wouldn't try to do it on their own. They wouldn't try to come up with their best, but that they would just pursue you and listen to you and, and to hear your guidance for, the, for a plan that, that is far better than they could write themselves. Lord, that you would lead them into a future that is bigger than they could imagine and that has way more impact than, than they would ever realize they could make and that they will, they will learn to, to have just a, such a closeness and a, and a depth of their relationship with you through the process. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.